from Microbe TV. This is Twevo, This Week in Evolution, Episode 6, recorded on February 23rd, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels LD. Greetings, everyone. Coming to you from LD Lab Studios. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I was going to say, I got to check the weather. I don't know where my phone is. Where did I put it? It's right here in front of me. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I often do, Nels? uh, I'll be on a my cell on a conversation and then I start looking for my cell phone and I go, oh crap, I lost Oops. it. And I go, oh my gosh, it's on my ear. <laughs> it's uh, like the old uh, losing your glasses trick <laughs> updated for the 21st century. Two degrees Celsius here. Uh, it is raining and dark. The, the sky is totally clouded out. Uh, you can't see anything out my window. Not a nice day. Ah, well, we're about the same temperature, but the atmosphere is quite a bit clearer I'm looking out across the valley to the Ochre Mountain Range. Uh, It's just beautiful. A little bit of snow on there and it's another sunny day in the valley, so to speak. We just released Tuivo 5. Yeah, that was a great conversation. I really enjoyed having our guests, Kardik and Sarah. Really cool back and forth with those two. Yep, it was really good. And, um, you know, I have to listen to it a few times because I edit it. Oh, sure. Yeah. Did you happen to listen to it again after the fact or you were satisfied with just participating? You know, it's always a little bit of tension to hear, like, <laughs> to revisit, you know, some of the slips or uh, so forth. But I did, I did listen to it this last weekend, and it's really fun because, you, you know, as it's happening, I think you miss some of the details. And so for sure, um, it is neat to hear it again. Yeah, was, yeah. I, I always enjoy it. I think uh, it's good, and I think it's a good series, this Tuivo thing. So far, so good. Yeah, I like yeah. it. So what have you been up to lately? Well, working away, traveling some. We've got had some good news here in the um, LD lab in the last month. We got a paper accepted that I'm really excited about. It's going to be emerging soon. It's on the inter- the evolution of the interferon response hmm. and um, some surprising connections to the activity of endogenous retrovirus uh, elements, hmm. which um, we did sort of a genome-wide view and then dug in. And so um, the paper is technically under embargo right now, but it should be out by the time this episode of Twivo airs. And so um, if folks are interested, take a peek in the March 4th issue of Science. We're really excited. So this is a, a postdoc in my lab um, who is co-mentored by a colleague of mine, Cedric Fischat. And the three of us um, have been working on this project for the last couple of years, and it's kind of come to a nice nice stage. That's something we'd be interested in over on Twiv? Yeah, that I think that sounds like a great idea. Why don't we... Um, coordinate on that Mm -hmm. and it would be it'd be especially fun i mean i think you know with the whole um tuivo unfolding there's plenty of uh, access to hearing me ramble away about science Mm -hmm. but (laughs) but perhaps my uh, co-authors ed chung and cedric fashat would be great to have on and i'll I'll, you know stop in and say hello i think you can find two mics over there right yeah we actually have a couple so we're ready to run all right that would be good Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can uh Look at that scheduling. That sounds like fun. But, um, you know, yesterday I taught my my um, undergraduate virology course. Yesterday was uh, reverse transcription and integration. Oh, there we go. And I said, you know, endogenous retroviruses, this has got to be the most successful viruses in the world. They are in 7 billion people. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Every one of us. How exactly. can you get more successful? They're in, I agree. They're in every one of us, and they've spread like crazy, too. Brilliant. Brilliant strategy. Someone emailed me yesterday, and I brought this up in my lecture. He said, why do retroviruses have to make DNA? They could just they have a plus strand genome. They could just be translated. And I go, ah, why? <laughs> you can integrate and get in the whole population of p- possibly every animal on the planet. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Nels, have you ever... You must have done this. Does I, I assume the Neanderthal genome has endogenous retroviruses, right? 
Absolutely. Does, does, does it have more or less than the human genome, do you know? Yeah, it's a good question. I haven't taken a close look. Others have. Um, you know what sometimes happens with these elements that are more repetitive? Those are sort of the last things that yeah. are considered. Yeah. Uh, as the annotations come out, everyone sort of, you know, the eyes are first locked on everything that's um, conserved in the same. And then when you get into the more repetitive elements that have had more volatile evolutionary histories, those are a little bit harder to pin down. But um, people are doing that. Um, we're not doing it in my lab, but again, my uh, colleagues, Cedric um, and Fashat and others are looking at that actively. I think it's going to be really cool. Hmm. Here's a paper in cell, Current Biology from two years ago, three years ago. Neanderthal and Denisovan retroviruses in modern humans. Yeah, so that's another. Wow. Yeah, that's another you know aspect of this, and we'll in our paper today, um, we'll kind of echo on some of these themes, which is uh, the idea of introgression. So as hybridization has happened, or gene flow, kind of in ancient times, um, followed by um, sort of ongoing. Uh, generations that you have these sort of interesting signals of uh, you know stuff that showed up in genomes a long time ago and then has kind of taken on its own history as we look mm -hmm. at, at species today. All right, this is just science is just so cool, and I got to tell you, Nels, this is why I love the podcast. I can talk about anything. <laughs> you and me both, and we're going to go out on a, <laughs> on a limb today, <laughs> out on a butterfly wing, in fact, and see where it, see where it takes us. You've been traveling at all. I have. So the um, science tour 2016 is uh, <laughs> continuing. Uh, since we last spoke, uh, I had two really fun trips back to back, one at um, University of Illinois, Chicago. So Susan Ross, who was re up until very recently at Penn, uh, is now the new chair of the microbiology and immunology departments um, department at UIC. And it's really a great place with uh, growing energy. I think she's going to be doing a lot of hiring in the next few years. So I think if we have any postdoctoral um, listeners out there, I would keep an eye on UIC um, and micro and immuno if, mm. that's your, if that's your cup of tea. Then I um, continued east, a little closer to you, uh, out east in, uh, to Penn State, and uh, gave a seminar at the Center for Infectious, Infectious Disease Dynamics. Um, this is run by Andrew Reed. Uh, I also saw Craig Cameron, who I'm guessing has shown up on TWIV at some point. Uh, really interesting. Yeah, his work viral. has, for sure. Okay, yep, yep. And that was part of a, I was invited by a postdoc, um, Tony Stoby, who was in Marilyn Rusnik's lab. And uh, mm. that was that was another really fun visit. How about you, Vincent? Have you been globetrotting at all? No, I, I teach uh, this semester, so I keep it to a minimum. They, gotcha. I teach uh, twice a week, and then I have office hours, and uh, I don't want to be an absent teacher you know i teach every lecture in my course myself all 25 and uh i think that that has a few levels of effect one they realize i'm dedicated and also it's consistent and it's yep. done the way i want to do it so yep. i just I, since we last talked you know uh, i had that pittsburgh episode where i got stuck in the snow i, I just remember. i went down to washington dc for a single day uh two weeks ago to do a podcast at the asm biodefense meeting Oh, wow. And actually, it was very good. I had uh, two individuals uh, on the show, Wyndham Latham, who works at North uh, Correct. Northwestern, right? Correct. Yeah, I know Wyndham. Yep. He works on, uh, on um, the plague bacterium, Yersinia, Yersinia pestis. pestis. Mm -hmm. And he's an evolutionary guy, too, I think, right? He's been trying to figure out how the pathogenicity evolved in that bacterium. Yeah, exactly. He's been picking up the evolutionary ideas more and more. And boy, that's a really fascinating system. He told this cool story about how people were getting um, DNA from old human teeth and sequencing it, and they found a lot of dark matter that they didn't know what it was. It turned out to be Yersinia. Yeah, it's pretty wild. <laughs> and they could yep. they could trace these virulence factors. And then my other guest, um, I'm I'm blanking on her name, so I'm going to have to look it up because I don't I've met um, Wyndham a few times, but uh, Yep. I did not meet, uh, let's see what her name, let's see how fast my page takes the load here. <laughs> Do you remember the um, biodefense organism in question? It's Rebecca Kading. Okay. She's at uh, Fort Collins, and she studies mosquito-borne pathogens. One of her big ones is Rift Valley Fever Virus. Uh-huh. And, of course, we brought up uh, Zika a little bit as well. Oh, yeah. And she was she's very interested in what makes a mosquito competent to replicate a virus and to transmit it 
and not just to humans, but to other animals. Really quite interesting stuff. I totally agree. All the arboviruses are just fascinating biology. I was speaking of Zika, I listened to your guys' um, podcast with um, Helen Lazier Mm -hmm. and Carolyn Coyne on Zika. Really fascinating conversation. I had seen Helen a few weeks before that. Um, I was down at UNC and had heard a little bit about those details. It's really incredible to see this thing unfolding in real time now. Well, that's why I find it interesting when it's not just papers that were published that you're looking back at, but you know, every week there's something new coming out. There's a lot of unanswered questions. So uh, for a podcast, it's fun to cover, and I also write about it on my blog. I have a blast. So... Uh, yeah, and didn't you get picked up by the Huffington Post on yeah. one of your? <laughs> yeah, when, when, the first blog post I wrote on Zika, you know, which I, so here's the thing, Nels. I figure I'm a virologist. I can yeah. figure things out. So I knocked off an hour, a post in an hour on Zika. Mm-hmm. It was like on a Thursday when it was just starting to build. I just said, you know, I have a feeling I should write a Zika post. And this thing went through the roof. With, wow. I mean, so over 45,000 views so far. Huh. And um, yeah, the Huffington Post picked it up. A lot of sites picked it up and linked back to it. Yeah. Um, I just said, I'm going to write a simple post, you know, 600 words explaining what what it is and what are the questions. And really, sometimes simple is better, you know. <laughs> totally agree, especially with all of the sort of hype and, I think, anxiety about that to sort of give a little more of a balanced perspective on the biology as a way of sort of counteracting some of the... Um, uh, negative possible overreactions or yeah. panicked kind of things. Yep. Yeah. I get, you know, I've gotten lots of calls from writers who are writing pieces. You know, the thing is, they're not scientists. They have to yeah. call people and learn and it takes days. I don't know. In fact, I don't know what the point is. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just get a couple of virologists to write yeah. some stories, you know? Yeah. Um, I know that there are plenty of outlets for news and so forth, but when you want to learn uh, virology, Talk to a virologist. You want to learn microbiology? Talk to a microbiologist, et cetera. You want to learn physics? Talk to Albert Einstein, right? <laughs> I agree. And having these conversations <laughs> sort of cross-pollinating them between virologists and journalists who, as a bridge, I think, to the general public, that can be useful too, right? To um, Well, they're trained to be able to do that, right? And, yeah. You know, not, it, not all scientists can can talk to the public, but I, yeah. I feel that I can. And um, oh, yeah. I yeah, think I, that I, my podcasts and my writings are not too complicated. For people, Absolutely. though pe- people tell me they're long, but you know, I say, well, <laughs> but, you know, this was like the week after the Super Bowl. People were saying they're too long. I said, really, you have no problem sitting down for three hours watching guys <laughs> smash each other's heads in. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if you could, at least for our topic, if you compare the evolutionary process, which has been unfolding for four billion plus years, what's an hour among friends or hour and a half? I don't know. There's nothing like <laughs> good. I mean, I love a good podcast. I, I have a two-hour drive, uh, two hours of commuting every day, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. I think it's a great way to learn stuff in other fields, you know. I agree. So, so, so speaking of that, why don't we jump in here? Yeah, we could just chat all hour, you know. That's right. That's the danger, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, <laughs> we, do, we do have a paper. <laughs> we do. And so um, it's interesting. So I, this is a paper, I think, as we mentioned, on the evolution of um, – patterning on butterfly wings and how there's sort of a regulatory evolution that's pretty complex and interesting. Um, I did notice this is becoming sort of an emerging sub-theme for us on Twivo, which is <laughs> considering organisms with wings. <laughs> I mean, we're only in our, into our sixth episode here, but we've already talked about bats and fruit flies and birds and blowflies, and uh, this episode will hit the butterflies. Wow, how about that? That's very interesting. I don't know why. Yeah. Maybe they're easy to study. Yeah, I think I well, bats aren't though. <laughs> that's true. Um, I think they there's a lot of them. I mean, so fruit flies obviously kind of hits the genetic model system yeah. um, uh, space pretty well. Things with wings, I think, also sort of ca- have captured the imagination uh, historically of naturalists and evolutionary biologists in particular. We'll get into that a little bit. And um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. We're gonna have to find some viruses or other pathogens with wings at this rate if we're gonna keep going. Are there virus, known viruses of butterflies? I'm sure there are, yeah. So the, oh, of course. So the um, baculoviruses, right? These no, viruses, that's right. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they'll hit caterpillars they, and they sort think of, of... caterpillars, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, you know, massive virus replication to the point where they basically are dissolving those caterpillars from the inside out. Really yeah. crazy, crazy biology. You know, there's some... Uh, 
the, the infection of these caterpillars by the baculoviruses makes them climb higher in the trees than they normally would. And that way when they lice, they sprinkle their stuff all over the leaves, uh, including the virus, and it's more effectively spread. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> so this, I, I love this. This, is this idea of microbial control of host behavior. Yeah, um, and that's been that example has been known for I think like a hundred years. Um, it was I think German um, naturalists who call it something like Wipfel Krankheit. That's when they, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason I know a little bit about this is I'm organizing a symposium in about a, uh, in two weeks actually over in Berlin on the topic of microbial control of host behavior as part of a. a Kavli Foundation National Academy of Science meeting with the uh, um, Alexander von Humboldt Society in Germany. So nice. That's kind of on the top of my mind right now. Yeah, really Berlin's cool Berlin's good town too. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Be fun. Yeah. yeah. So how did you pick this butterfly paper? Yeah. So you know, for a couple of reasons. So one is that um, there's a lot of interesting evolutionary biology that's been unfolding. I would say in the last couple decades on the genetic changes underlying morphological structures, and we'll kind of get into that. But I also wanted to pick a paper that um, moves away from the evolution of protein coding regions. So most of the um, papers we've discussed, um, whether it was you know last time with the um, NPC1, the Neiman Pick receptor that Ebola viruses are um, using to access cells, or you know some of the other stories are all involving uh, amino acid substitutions in many of these cases. But there's a huge amount of attention paid to um, the prevalence of non-coding mutation or non-coding variation and how that impacts um, especially developmental biology, EVO-DEVO, um, and other areas of biology. So it's, I think it's a really important sort of pillar of evolutionary work that um, we're sort of overdue to consider. And then in the context of these butterfly wings, I think it's just incredibly um, beautiful, and so kind of fun to to consider that as well. So there's a there's a kind of a principle here in that when when you're dealing with a protein, evolution is hard because especially especially if it has more than one function, right? Yeah, exactly. So this idea of um, pleiotropy. So if you're going to adapt to one function of the protein, the other one may get screwed. Whereas if you're just looking at a control element, as we'll see in this paper could be easier to change that, right? Yeah, so that's exactly, that's one of the main ideas. Um, and also, I think semi-related to this is the um, idea of where sort of novel things happen or, you know, or emerge from and, the, and sort of a related idea that by changing the controlling elements, the enhancers, the promoters, the transcriptional regulators, that you can have these sort of massive jumps mm. in adaptive space that may not be as easy to sort of um, traverse through just um, a series of point mutations in protein coding regions. So let me throw a wrench in this, okay? Yeah, of course. So many genes have, most genes have transcriptional control regions. They have binding sites for proteins that control transcription. They have enhancers that are also protein binding sites farther upstream. And that's what we're talking about here. But many genes share the same upstream binding sites. So if you change the site itself... You was, you you're going to have to change the protein, and then that may screw up more than one thing. So that's not what we're talking about here, though, right? Yeah, that's no, you're that's right. And so in this case, the idea is that binding is sort of is still is constrained and still happening, but you're doing it in sort of novel combinations mm -hmm. or in sort of novel contexts, maybe a different tissue or a different cell type, okay. and that okay. and that that yeah yeah. But this actually has stirred a lot of controversy over the last few years. There's a um, there's kind of an interesting back and forth between um, Sean Carroll on one side and actually. He's a good person to bring up. So, um, Sean Carroll up at Madison in the in the last uh, decade or two has done a lot of the um, really foundational work using fruit flies again, Drosophila, and looking at um, wing morphology, wing patterning, that um, the development of that and the evolutionary implications. Uh, and he had a I can't remember if it was a review or, or some piece that really sort of put out some of these ideas that it would be through regulatory evolution or evolution of non-coding regions that that would be sort of the main driver, one of the main mechanisms yeah, that yeah. this kind of stuff would unfold. And then there was sort of a um, prickly counterpunch in a review in the journal Evolution written by Jerry Coyne. He's at University of Chicago. And then Hopi Hoekstra, who we've spoken about on Twivo a bit. She's out at Harvard. And they were saying, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, 
trying to make the point that even if you look at some of these examples that Sean Carroll was holding up and was, were emerging from his lab at the time, that the jury was still out, that um, there could be a lot of protein coding mutations um, that were just as sort of important or even more so uh, in terms of their prevalence. They pointed out things like gene duplication as being a way to sort of have a, um, a, a large adaptive event um, uh, through that mechanism where you add an entire mm. um, protein or gene that encoding a protein in that case. And so, you know, in the end, I think it was a lot of, it was a lot of hot air more maybe than, <laughs> and they actually probably agreed more than they disagreed. And so that controversy sort of died down. And then since then, we've just seen work coming out kind of on both sides of, um, of, the, of the ledger, both seeing in- very interesting evolutionary mechanisms involving non-coding changes, but also protein coding changes as well. These kinds of arguments are kind of fruitless because they both, they're, they're both important in the end, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> it's kind of arguing like two sides of the same coin or something almost in, the, in a sense, yeah. Mm. So this paper today... Um, is sort of, I would say is kind of an interesting um, extension of some of that, uh, let's say, controversy or some of the idea that non-coding evolution can really drive, um, uh, in, in this case, morphological evolution. And so instead of now using the uh, genetic model system, the fruit fly that's been domesticated in the lab for a really long time, the authors of this paper um, kind of go back to butterflies. Um, and this actually draws all the way back sort of to the beginnings of evolutionary theory in the, you know, the Victorian naturalists. So um, guys like Darwin and Henry Walter Bates, who are, you know, down in the Amazonian rainforest, looking at butterflies and moths and other colorful critters and making these observations that there's actually this really interesting um, evolutionary system of mimicry going on where actually unrelated butterflies, for example, that can't mate with each other have these really striking similarities in appearance. Hmm. Um, and so now, you know, fast forward 150 plus years, uh, and we're in the kind of genomics or post-genomics era, we're now gaining, um, sort of a a high resolution view of the genes and the, um, genetic basis of how these things are inherited and how unrelated things can sort of, um, undergo this convergent evolution or, or in this case, um, of the butterflies have these really striking similar appearances. So for this, you have to go out in the field and collect butterflies, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, and that's um, <laughs> that's part of the I think part of the fun, but also part of the hard work here. Um, and another example, I think, of this um, functional synthesis that we've been really hammering away at on Twivo, where as you go out into the field, you can sort of sample a lot of the diversity and complexity in the ecosystems, and then. Um, bring it back to the lab and with um, increasingly powerful um, genome-focused technologies start to understand how this complexity sort of exists or uh, unfolds in the wild. So can you remind me uh, how butterflies work, Um, how how they reproduce? I know they make a caterpillar, but where does the caterpillar come from? Yeah, uh Uh (laughs) uh-oh. So... Um, you know, at least I don't know about you, but at least for me, um, I mean, butterfly, like growing up, right. With, in keeping caterpillars, um, watching them make a chrysalis and yeah, then emerging yeah. as butterflies is one of the things that sort of you know, wakes you up to being a biologist is just to see that in your backyard and, you know, in keeping these things in little cages and, and watching the process. So, um, butterflies are lepidopterans. They're, you know, butterflies and moths fall into this category of, um, insects and they go through a pretty standard, um, if not sort of beautiful and kind of morphologically dramatic, um, transformations from the larva or caterpillar stage, um, to the, um, adult, which then, you know, those butterflies will mate and then produce new larva, new caterpillars that they'll, you know, like for the case of the monarch, they'll put those larva on the underside of a milkweed leaf and then the caterpillar will grow up, eat the milkweed form a chrysalis and go from there. So the female lays the larvae. Correct. And is there sex involved? There is. <laughs> um, yep. <laughs> That's so we've now male, they're male and female <laughs> butterflies, right? They're male and female butterflies. Yeah, this the um And they mate or does the, does the male like fertilize oh, the larvae? Uh they mate. Okay. And so yeah, they mate. And That's one of the things I didn't learn as a kid, you know, with the butterflies. 
Yeah. So, and we've now, you know, uh, I'll concede that we've now stretched my sort of knowledge of that's okay of, of insect reproduction to the limit. But you I know, wanted to see how far <laughs> I could. <push. laughs> there is um, there is really interesting work on um, sex chromosome evolution in insects. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Some uh, again, turning you know the powerhouse, the genetic system in Drosophila. There's a great um, lab at Berkeley, Doris Backtrog's lab, that have has really uncovered some. Uh, interesting and unexpectedly complex evolution in the sex chromosomes and the um, the way that that's uh, unfolding at the um, genetic level. But in terms of the um, you know kid growing up in your backyard level, it's pretty standard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A, couple, uh, a couple of years ago, I wanted to do an insect podcast. Oh, interesting. You know, and I approached a woman who I found on on the uh, social media, and she's an entomologist, but she didn't want to do it in the end. But uh, I think. It's probably most interesting in terms of evolution to study insects, right? Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, you have this, so there are a ton of insects, first of all, and they sort of radiated all over the world, um, filling different niches. And so you have all of this um, diversity and it's just sort of like a playground, I think, for, for, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. this the, the senior author on this paper is from the UK, right? Chris, Chris Jiggins? Yeah, that's right. And so... Um, I thought it would be, it's always fun to have guests. Um, I thought it'd be a little challenging to, to grab Chris Jiggins since um, it's a bit later, right, when we yeah, yeah. record our podcast. Um, there's also, and, and I actually have, I know Chris's work, and I think I might have met him briefly at an evolution meeting or two, um, but I actually know one of the co-authors on this paper um, a little bit better, a fellow named Jim Mallett. Um, he's, he, so he was actually Chris Jiggins' um, graduate or postdoctoral mentor, I think maybe a little of both, mostly graduate mentor. Mm. Um, and Jim is an uh, incredible evolutionary ecologist who has done a lot of, again, this kind of fundamental or foundational work on um, collecting and characterizing the, some of the butterflies that we'll be considering in today's paper in the um, Heliconius um, mm -hmm. genes. Yeah, yeah. Turns out Jim is also the husband of Hopi Hoekstra. So oh, okay. um, he now spends a lot of his time at Harvard, both Hopi and Jim were here in Utah a couple of years ago. Hopi gave a great seminar, and um, it turns out Jim and Hopi have also done their own sort of um, genome-wide association or linkage experiment. They have a, a really cute son who uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> who they brought along to Utah and was hanging out with us. This is a few years gotta, ago. We've got to have him on the show one day. Yeah, that would be really fun. Now, so, now, so he is he's kind of an e he collects butterflies and categorizes them. He doesn't study their evolution on a molecular level, although he does in this paper. But I, I suspect that's Jiggins driving it, right? That's right. And so I think, you know, this is another example of um, uh, perhaps how this functional synthesis is unfolding, um, where people who have, um, you know, really specialized in um, ecological genetics, ecological evolution, mm. are now sort of teaming up or extending the work into uh, molecular biology. And so I'd say Jim sort of has a foot in both worlds um, coming from the, uh, the ecological side of things. Okay. And, and in fact, we'll see um, in one of the figures, I believe one of the um, species of butterflies named after him, uh, <laughs> Heliconius malatai. Malatai, yeah. cool. <laughs> Is there going to be an LD? Something? Uh, we'll see. None that I know of yet, but um, uh, yeah. if we can get it more out into the field, who knows what we'll discover. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Is there a... No, my name is... No, my, na my, name, <laughs> my, name, my name is too complicated, right? <laughs> when you discover viruses, you typically don't name them after yourself, right? Because they fall into a known family usually, right? That's true. And for a lot of these um, insects and other species... Um, oftentimes it's someone else who sort of um, names it in honor of someone. Yeah, you shouldn't do it after yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that can get a little bit <laughs> dicey. And, and and maybe as a disclaimer, as we as we go through the paper, we'll probably be trying to pronounce the um, oh yeah the species right. names of some of these guys and uh, you know just a pre uh, apology for butchering all of the pronunciations. So I learned that there are over eighteen thousand species of butterfly. Yeah, isn't that incredible? And they can mostly be distinguished by wing pattern. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I guess that makes sense because they were probably categorized a long time ago before any sequencing or molecular technique. So you had to do it by, by morphology, right? 
Yeah, exactly what you could see. And it turns out there's some really cool biology behind um, what's sort of forming or shaping the morphology. Mm -hmm. and, and again, this is this idea of mimicry. Or, and so these mimicry rings, this might be familiar to a lot of folks who kind of, um, as we, in our intro bio classes, the idea of Batesian or Mullerian mimicry. And so just to kind of recap, the ideas of Batesian mimicry, um, named after Henry Walter Bates, is that uh, so you have a poisonous species of butterfly, and the, and the idea is that this is a defense against predators, birds, and other creatures that would otherwise um, snack on these conspicuous um, <laughs> big-winged insects flying through their neighborhood. Uh, and then there's sort of this evolutionary motivation for other species, which are edible, if they can just if they they appear like that poisonous species in their markings, p colors, patternings, then they could avoid being eaten by predators just by fooling the predator into thinking that this is a poisonous right. species. And then they, yeah, go ahead. And that is just a random event, a mutation or mutations that just randomly make a butterfly look like the, the poisonous one and it survives and that gene penetrates, right? Correct. So that's the idea is Darwinian selection through, um, you know, tons of random mutations and then natural selection acting on it. And in this case, if it's, it's basically life or death, if you can avoid predators, then you have a much better chance of reproducing than if you're eaten before you can. So uh, this can go across genera as well or across species, right? It can, anything with a wing could in theory evolve to have uh, the same pattern as the poisonous one. Yeah, absolutely. And in a lot of cases, it also turns out, so this is the distinction of Mullerian mimicry, is that in this case, um, sort of at its most basic level, you have, all again, these unrelated species, sometimes closely related, but and we'll dive into this with the paper, um, but and sometimes very distantly related or not really related at all species, that um, mm -hmm. in this case, they're all poisonous, but they sort of share um, a, a similar marking, and it sort of enforces, the idea is that that pattern gets sort of enforced and it becomes almost a brand for predators to say, oh, wow, we should avoid this. And so that's, in that case, they're all poisonous. But they, the idea is that they're gaining an advantage sort of by safety in numbers, in a sense, or enforcing a, um, a, a, a true marking of what it means to be poisonous. So why aren't all butterflies poisonous then? Well, so part of the idea there is that there's actually a cost to mm. um, Encoding um, the not only the genes but also to carrying the poison itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's you know it's not the most fun thing to have around, and so that's sort of where the idea of the Batesian um, strategy um, emerged, and it, it's certainly true. People are still actually actively working on the the consequences of this, so trying to um, set up uh, almost experimental systems in. Uh, cages or uh, semi in the wild and see what the population dynamics play mm -hmm. out. And mm -hmm. so far, I think it's been the um, the returns have been mixed in terms of like a very clear, like you gain an advantage here or there. It's probably more complicated than that. But so if the poisonous butterflies went away, eventually the mimicry would go away too, right? Yeah, that's the idea. Or, you know, for example, let's say the edible, there's an edible guy who's really good at mimicking a poisonous guy. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon, everyone, you know, th that uh, edible butterfly population will sort of drown out the poisonous ones if mm -hmm. they have a disadvantage to keeping their poison. Yeah. And then pretty soon the predators will forget that that <laughs> marking. And so there's sort of these fluctuations that are then <laughs> sort of hypothesized. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been pretty hard to tease that apart, I think, in a convincing way. And there's sort of evidence, uh, empirical evidence on both sides of the ledger in terms of how this may or may not be happening in the way that seems sort of, um, you know, intellectually intuitive. Are there other, aside from butterfly poison, are there other examples of this kind of mimicry? Oh, yeah, all over the place. So, um, you know, think of like there are other insects that instead of looking like other or um, other insect species, like the butterflies will st start resembling snakes, for mm -hmm. example. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you can just do internet searches and spend like a lifetime basically just staring at these fascinating cases one after another of species mimicking each other the whole idea of like a stick insect mimicking a a tree and the, mm -hmm. you know it just you can we could talk for hours it's really cool huh. but so for today's paper we're not going to we're going to kind of move away from the um sort of the biological outcomes of this and instead really drill down at the um more genetic level to ask you know what are the what sort of the genetic basis of how these patterns emerge in the first place or how unrelated things might 
um, start to look like each other through this uh, convergent evolution. And so, you know, it kicks right off, I think, in a really beautiful, um, the first figure which shows some of these heliconius uh, butterflies and illustrates um, strikingly how this mimicry can sort of be enforced across very diverse species. Uh, so, you know, there's about an image of 17 different insects. I think 16 of them are butterflies. One is a moth. Did you notice that in the, in the figure? It's kind of fatter. I figure that's the moth, right? <laughs> Exactly, that one down at the, <laughs> the bottom. <laughs> the bottom. Exactly. But isn't it wild just to see the um, the same markings? Yeah, I mean, I mean if you look stuff. quickly, you wouldn't know. It's just got the same yeah. colors. It's just a little browner, I think. But I, Yeah, I agree. Those just radiating gets, red stripes are the key, right? Yeah, it just blows my mind. So, And that gets at, um, so the morphological features that the authors will be considering for this paper are sort of in you know um, beautiful display here. So there are two... Uh, specific markings that we'll be focusing on. One is the called the Dennis spot, I guess, and this is in the forewings um, near the head. Uh, there are these sort of red patches that mm -hmm. are interrupted with little black lines. Um, that's the first one. And then the so-called ray pattern, which is on the hind wings and is sort of this obvious just um, striping mm -hmm. that's happening. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... Um, and just to say that actually a lot of this biology, these are, um, again, Heliconius genus, um, for the most part, that they're focusing on sort of the three main parts of this um, um, alliance of species. There's actually, did, I, there's so many different names for these things, and I just don't know the butterfly biology well enough. There are tribes and alliances and so on and so forth, so I'll probably be kind of um, butchering that as well. Um, but so... This has been studied for a long time, um, and even there's, uh, there was already some um, genetic evidence that there was uh, a transcription factor called optics, which was somehow controlling the deposition of these Dennis spot and ray patterns during the development of these um, related or unrelated insects. And so um, what uh, Jiggins' group was doing here um, in collaboration with um, – Jamel and then the, the, the other folks was to actually collect a lot more and to do a lot more sequencing. So this is like an example of how the um, sort of the democratization of genome sequencing technology has really allowed people to push to the next level with studies like this. So they already had the framework, but really didn't could really tease apart sort of the genetic basis um, of this through genetic associations. And we'll talk about that in a minute using Illumina sequencing and just getting a lot more um, genomes to look at. So do we know before this paper what the transcription factor was regulating, what kind of gene? Yeah, I think there was there is something known about that. Um, I haven't looked. I didn't dig down too much into that. Yeah. And in fact, this paper doesn't really spend much time, right. I would say, talking about sort of the functional consequences um, of this. It really is um, kind of defining the architecture of the regulatory elements here and then mm -hmm. using that high resolution to um, build an interesting um, hypothesis about the evolutionary history of how these unrelated guys kind of came to have the same patterns. But yeah, so all of, I think those papers are, are um, to get at your question, those papers, there is a bit known about optics, which is in sort of this transcription factor, what genes it's turning on, when and where, mm -hmm. that might actually be sort of the nuts and bolts of, um, you know, defining these uh, wing patterns, but yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I just don't know that. I presume much. that it's probably more than one gene. It's not just the, it's not just the pigment gene, for example. It's something that affects the patterning and all that sort of Ex thing, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's you know, and it's unfolding as the um, you know, the caterpillar is is metamorphosized in the chrysalis and is now um, you know breaking free and sort mm -hmm. of um, uh, undergoing that whole process. And then, you know, to say, and it's actually gene regulation on top of gene regulation in the sense that, so optics is turned on yeah, and we'll be sure. talking about these enhancers by other transcription factors that they don't um, spend much, if any time, um, giving us the details on that. And so it's sort of like you're using a transcription factor to turn on another transcription factor or to modulate its regulation. And so you can see how it can get pretty complex pretty quickly. It's transcription factors all the way down. <laughs> That's right. I love it. <laughs> when does it stop? Who knows? <laughs> well, I, I, we'll keep working and see if we get there. <laughs> it's uh, turtle transcription factors That's all right. the way down as well. <laughs> so they collected 96 butterflies. 
It doesn't yeah. seem like a lot, but where did they have to go for this? So I think we're talking about, um, again, South America, right? Yeah. So was, it, was it Peru or Equ- Ecuador? Ecuador, maybe? yeah, yeah. Yep. And um, kind of retracing some of the old voyages by those Victorian hmm. naturalists, I, th- I would say. I agree, 96 doesn't sound like a lot, but then when you think of each of those being a lane on a high seek, I mean, yeah. genomics has come a long way but it's still not um totally cheap and so it's a uh, well probably they probably they probably mixed uh, you can do a lot of samples in one lane right yeah that's right so do sort of barcoding um potentially yeah. uh, it's still well. expensive yeah correct yeah and and the data sets also become i mean you just are churn, churning out a massive amount of data that you then you need to analyze and so that becomes from a even a computational standpoint yeah, it's tough. can start to add up yeah yeah i mean even the, the question i asked you before how many Herbs are in the Neanderthal genome. You can't just look at the sequence and pull it out because it's three billion base pairs. You have to That's right, do exactly. computationally do it, right? Correct. And the other thing we should mention, and actually they point this out a little bit in their methods, is that so as they're um, defining these enhancers um, elements, um, they do have some cutoffs that they use. So you know they need them. They're uh, using filters to have a minimum what they call I think. Uh, sequence depth or copy number depth Mm -hmm. from their data set. And so when you're doing this Illumina style sequencing, um, you're not getting even coverage over all 3 billion bases or however many bases are in that genome. It's, and it can, you know, there are all these contingencies and variables and technical artifacts that start to kind of add up against you. And so you end up with a, a lot of coverage in some areas and almost none in others. And when you're talking about the endogenous retroviruses, for example, if they're super repetitive or in, regions of the genome that are just hard for this technology to sequence, then those become sort of blind spots. So, so Nels, they say in the methods, they took the wings, they caught these butterflies in the field. I could just see, what did you do for your PhD? Oh, I caught butterflies, mom. <laughs> <laughs> what? I love it. <laughs> uh, they put the wings in an envelope and they labeled it, and I guess it says to where, and then the bodies, they extracted DNA for sequencing, right? Yeah, that's right. And so I think, you know, and that's actually that chain of custody is really important. So even if we look in figure one, so if you were to build, you know, if you're, if without knowing any of the hard work of working out the genetics and the relationships between all of these, if you just looked at them, you'd probably, and we're going, we'll talk about the phylogenetics in a moment, but if you were going to gr- put together a, a tree based on the appearance and the relatedness between these, you'd actually make a lot of mistakes because mm. what we're seeing here is convergent evolution where a lot of these resemblances are based more on the locality Hmm. of the species that are collected versus the actual relatedness between them. Yeah. 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 And so that's where, again, kind of this translating from the ecological setting to the laboratory is, you know, has some important work. Um, You know, now some of these look like spider legs, these patterns, you know, (laughs) I wonder. (laughs) They're (laughs) thinking there's a even more nefarious defense hiding out here. Who knows? Scaring the birds. Oh, the birds eat spiders. So I don't know if that works, but they're really cool patterns. You could make a nice t-shirt out of this, couldn't you? I totally agree. We should, so, and we should put this up on our, um, on the web, the Twivo website as part of. For sure, because this is an open access paper. Yeah, exactly. So, and you know, Nels, our 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 icon for Twivo has a butterfly on it. How about that? <laughs> yeah, it's not a coincidence. So that I have to, <laughs> I have to say that one of the things that, as I was kind of moving a little more, my training more into evolutionary biology, it really were, were these stories of mimicry among butterflies that mm-hmm. kind of inspired me. But then, you know, in my lab, um, we're thinking about it more. How does some of these ideas apply at the molecular level, and some of the mimicry that we see pathogens employ to um, disable or hijack our own, um, as hosts, our own sort of cell biology. And so, you know, they, I think you have to be a little careful because the analogies aren't perfect, but mm-hmm. some of the mechanisms are the same. Some of the biology is the same. It's just happening on the, you know, molecular level where proteins are sharing resemblances. A virus protein might look like mm. a host protein and allows the virus to sort of tune the, its infected cell host to its advantage using sort of the principles of mimicry in, in different ways. Okay. Yeah. So they got they do the whole genome with this uh, sequence analysis, right? Yeah. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, I think part of the reason for this is, well, first of all, it's now it's, it's very easy to do. But what this also allows them, um, it, and with, you know, capturing about 100 individuals, is they can now use sort of mapping techniques, genetic mapping techniques. So these, um, what they call genotype to phenotype associations 
um, with more power, more statistical power. So basically what they're doing is they're trying to match the um, morphological resemblances, again, with those two, focusing on two elements, the, um, the Dennis spot or the Ray hindwing patterns. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's the phenotype that they're associating with a genotype and asking if you do a genome-wide comparison and then look for um, uh, genetic variation that associates perfectly with the phenotypic as- variation, those patterns, um, what are the matching mm-hmm. sets? And then they use that to narrow down to candidate, those associations to narrow to candidate regions that might explain the genetic basis um, of the morphology. And as you can see in figure two, um, panel B, below now the beautiful butterflies is a beautiful association plot where they're showing the SNPs that um, are associated with either the Dennis pattern on the left or the Ray pattern on the right. Um, And there are basically these two peaks that arise right next door to that optics gene, that transcription factor that we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I think this was actually not that surprising to them. So they had associated both of those patterns to this region. But what's new in this paper, and it owes to the fact that they had done all of this additional sampling, is that they could go back and get an even higher resolution view of this. And that actually Mm -hmm. um, allowed them to delineate uh, not just one enhancer region near optics, but two separate ones where the Dennis um, association was completely separate. Uh, from the ray association. They're separated by, I'm just trying to add this up, it looks like about 10 KB. Um, and then they were using, again, just all those multiple comparisons to say, basically, if you have the Dennis pattern, do you have the same um, variation at that location? And the answer was yes, for about a 10 KB window um, in terms of the, the Dennis spots. And then for a larger window, I think about 25 K, uh, KB for the um, ray pattern sitting right next door. Was this analysis done on the whole sequence or did they just look around optics? Yeah, good question. And my guess is that um, they probably did both. So, and even though there's, you know, and, and we should back up a little bit, I think, and say that these associations are just that, they're associations. So, right, right. Um, and you can put a statistical test to that in some amount of confidence that there is something to the function, but they haven't actually, and this will, we can maybe talk about this as we finish up the paper, they haven't actually shown through, um, you know, experimental manipulation to prove that this underlies the um, actual pattern. Mm -hmm. So, and, and also to say that this may, just because you have this association might not explain the entire phenotype. Yeah. So it's associated with it, but there could be other places uh, in other, you know, completely different chromosomal regions, different chromosomes that are contributing to this biology as well. And so having the whole genome data set could be very useful for continuing to dissect the genetic basis of this. Okay, got it. Yeah, yep. Okay, so then, you know, once, so the kind of step forward, I would say, for them was that now they had actually defined, so what they thought was sort of a simple story with these, both of these patterns kind of, you know, perhaps being, intertwined with regulating the optics um, transcription factor somehow. And now it appears like they're actually separable, at least on the level of um, where the enhancers are located in the genome. And then they kind of did it even, zoomed in even farther, I would say, um, by mapping some of the variation in that 10 KB and 25 KB region by sequencing, sort of picking a few other um, some more of these diverse butterflies that are sort of sort of related, but more mm-hmm. distantly related. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they could map out. So now that they're doing this targeting resequencing, they're really, you know, now they're not focusing on the whole genome, just right. this area. Right. And you can get sort of a, a codon by codon look at this. And this actually allowed them to kind of do fine mapping where they're getting, they're defining the edges of the breakpoints even more closely. And so just actually in figure three, there, I think there's a nice um, example of how, adding more diversity can sort of allow them to narrow down this region. So if you look on the right side of the um, of figure three, there's um, this Heliconius uh, mariana butterfly, mm-hmm. which is a bit more distantly related. And if you look at, so they're mapping now the um, ray pattern, which is missing in that guy. And in fact, there's a recombination event. So it they have it as a blue box mm. next to the red box. And that sort of gave them the um, highest resolution of where um, you have this sort of uh, enhancer signature um, for the guys that actually have the ray pattern. Mm. And so 
basically the more um, sampling you do, the better you can define that region based on who has or doesn't have that morphology. Mm. So uh, Mariana lost the ray pattern because of this recombination event? Is that is That's that? the idea, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, the, and the recombination site is, the, is shown by the dotted line on this. Correct, right. exactly. Yep, yep, yep. And so that haplotype out mm-hmm. to there um, resembles more of this other butterfly. I think it's... Um, um, the one in D on the left, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, or in E, which is in a different group. Uh, the, e. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, the side no... Um, Pachyonis clade, which is a completely different clade. And so um, because of that recombination event, it actually looks closer to that other more distantly related guy. Mm. So, so yeah, so it's a really cool kind of, um, you know, detective work to define this. I think, you know, you can kind of do that in, in that it does define it better. I think what the real power here, though, is it allows now that they have, because they know sort of the phylogenetic relationships between a lot of these clades. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is, again, actually where having the genome-wide data can be useful as well, is that you can now actually take um, into account the evolutionary or phylogenetic relationships between these different species and sort of overlay that with the um, haplotypes they're seeing at these regions mm-hmm. and, and basically look for violations of the known relationships between these species um, and the relatedness between these enhancer sites. And that combination, which we'll see in the next couple of figures as they do the phylogenetic analysis, allows them to really infer um, sort of the complex evolution of how these various species kind of came to resemble each other, at least by the definition mm-hmm. of this part of that that biology. So these are non-coding regions, right? Yeah, exactly right. And so, um, and they again, they don't talk a whole lot about that biology. Sort of, how are these enhancers modulating yeah, right, the right. gene expression? But exactly, so the you know, and you can imagine scenarios, and I don't know how well this has worked out, but where basically, if you have these two guys together, two enhancers together that you get some combination of transcription factors that then give you both patterns, or if you have one but not the other, then you have um, sort of, you basically turn on optics at a different time or in a different place Mm -hmm. uh, during development, and then that leads to just one of the patterns in the absence of the other. Um, And in fact, it sounds like it gets even more complicated than that, that within a species, you you can start to have... um, recombination and sort of variation arising that might even impact um, what these butterflies look like as well. So Mm -hmm. again, this idea of the non-coding regions providing the kind of raw genetic material to do a lot of tinkering with different uh, mutations that can then, you know, natural selection can then act on um, as these butterflies, excuse me, are getting picked off by predators like birds. Hmm. Okay. So if we look now at the um, at, at the phylogenetics, and maybe I thought it would be a good idea to just step back a little bit. So I think we've talked on Twivo a little bit about phylogenetic analysis, um, but to introduce it perhaps you know slightly more formally. So the very simple idea here is that, um, and I think everyone is sort of intuitively familiar with um, a evolutionary tree or a phylogenetic tree, where you're inferring evolutionary relationships between organisms. And so, you know, when evolutionary folks first started building these trees, they would do it based on characters, morphological characters for the most part, um, you know, in the pre um, DNA era, pre molecular era. And so, um, if you weren't making careful observations, like in the example of these butterflies, if you weren't making very careful observations about the behavior, so who they were reproducing with, for example, then you might be fooled into thinking that because all of these mimics look the same, that they're probably closely related to each other. And um, so it c- kind of mentioned this at the top in the first figure. If you were only building a phylogenetic tree based on the resemblance of the wings, you would sort of be fooled into putting moths together with butterflies, potentially, even though they're very distantly related. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and then what's happened? And so and actually, I think that illustrates how incredible like those observations that Henry Walter Bates and the fact that they were not getting fooled at least in yeah. in seeing this mimicry and sort of proposing it as the evolutionary process is just kind of staggering. Um, but uh, what's happened then more recently is as we've added you know tons of genome sequencing data. Um, we can now we've now ref, we continue to refine our trees where we think we're actually getting a, a more true uh, 
view of the evolutionary relationships between organisms um, based on the conservation of a um, you know ribosomal RNA or a, a very um, conserved feature of many genomes across uh, a lot of diversity. And so I just wanted to mention that so as we build these trees, you you know, it can be tempting in some cases as we kind of employ more powerful technology and um, genome analysis to it to think that this actually does represent the true sort of evolutionary history of mm -hmm. the divergence mm -hmm. from a last common ancestor. But in fact, every tree should, I think, really be considered as a hypothesis that it's, you know, you have some set of data, not the complete picture, and that you're building an arrangement that says this is how it might be. But then from there, um, you know, you want to have ways of um, testing for evidence of this or other ways of basically um, uh, inferring what's going on. And so any phylogenetic you treat that you see should be taken with a grain of salt. Isn't, um, isn't also an issue that the samples you typically have are contemporary? Absolutely. So that's, yeah, exactly. So all of the um, phylogenetic reconstruction is basically based on sampling extant hmm. variation and then working backwards. It's really interesting. So that's one of the you know ways of testing a tree is as we do more and more sampling of ancient, like fossilized samples. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then and then because those actually do um, represent right. actual, you know, spots along um, uh uh, nodes along um, the more ancient branches. Yeah, for viruses, we often don't have that. We have contemporary viruses. We don't have very old ones. And if we do, we just have a handful. So it's not. That's right. You know, yeah. Although that's a, another cool spot where, um, you know, genomics is sort of adding a new uh, angle to this is when you see the endogenized viruses, not necessarily even the yeah, retroviruses, yeah. right? But some of these um, yeah, yeah. kind of genetic accidents where you get these fossilized things. And it's really changed, I think, in fundamental ways the way we think about how viruses are constrained and the surprise that, you know, like a 60 million year old virus that can be dated based on phylogenetics um, looks pretty much like it's contemporary. Yep. yep. Uh, yeah. It's really fast. So that you can do because it's in the species and you can relate the species on a tree, you know, which one supposedly came first and how old it is. And you look at um, when the, the, the virus went in based on, you know, what species were before and followed it. And you can kind of date it that way, right? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, it's very cool stuff. Yeah, I agree. And g increasingly getting powerful. Although at the same time, it's so it turns out that it's not just, you know, oh, let's sequence an entire genome and add that to a tree. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't work uh, in every case. So there are cases um, where, and it's kind, of, it's kind of intuitive to think the more, um, you know, comparisons that we're making of the genetic differences, the more powerful the um, or more accurate the inference going back might be. But just as we were discussing earlier, you know, if you have a lot of um, repetitive regions or uh, evolutionarily volatile regions where things are changing really constantly, it's really hard to know how to weigh those comparisons. Yeah, and so yeah. you end up seeing, and then when you start to include. Um, uh, you know, the more diversity you sample, the more times that sort of arguments of parsimony or even kind of statistical, um, statistically backed inferences on what uh, v what variation looked like, they're violated by things like recombination. Um, some other things we'll talk about introgression um, in more detail for these butterflies. And so, if you go uh, back far enough, now would you not recognize the sequences anymore because it's it's so diverged? Is that, yeah. part of, is that a problem? We don't have any old samples like that, but in theory, one could... You know, I've seen yeah. estimates of some viruses at 200 million years old, but mm -hmm. you go what, beyond that. Yeah. What would they look like? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what... It's actually pretty incredible, I think, about... Like, so Carl Wu's work back um, 30, 40 years ago, where they were looking... You know, so they're specifically asking, what is the most conserved thing? Like, if I take a bacteria, an archaea, or a eukaryote, and compare their sequences, what's common, Yeah, right. which then implies that that was around in the last common ancestor sort of in deep time. And that's where some of the um, ribosomal um, uh, trees first arose from. Yeah. So I think yeah. actually because you still see conservation there, that there is that um, yeah. yep. super deep conservation in some of those cases. But that's sort of the exception rather than the rule for most of genetic uh, sort of genome contents where genetic material is just getting turned over. Well, of course, for viruses, we don't have such conserved thing, although yeah. people like Eugene Coonan say there's a core 
set of genes, which seem to be, at least some of them are conserved in all the viruses as far as you go back. So that's the best you can do. And he would argue that, you know, because of that, you can trace them as far back as they arose. Yep, I agree. Yeah, and again, really interesting work. Um, and basically borrowing that same principle or using that same principle yeah. of conservation. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So it does turn out, though, that sometimes when, you vi- when these things get violated, so um, the... In, the things I'm talking about is sort of the chain of custody of a genetic element. So um, it, that can actually be useful too for um, building or for understanding sort of how the evolution of something unfolded. And that actually brings us back to the butterfly paper. So in the fourth figure, they basically are doing phylogenetic reconstruction. So the first is basically, and this is mostly based off of, again, work that's been done for the last um, you know decades or so of defining um, and um, cataloging the diversity of the Heliconius genus. And so the first um, tree that they show just highlights how um, the relatedness of the species based on sort of gene-based, sort of conserved, um, well-behaved genes that um, are used to infer the ancestry and the relationships between the modern species um, doesn't, they don't uh, sort of sit together based on the morphology of the wing patterns. And so they show this um, um, to illustrate this, they have for the wings, they describe three patterns. So the so-called tiger pattern. And then in red, they have their dentist spot. And then in orange, the ray hind wing that we've been already talking about. And so if it was just a very simple genetic history of the dentist spot showed up in an ancestor, the ray spot showed up mm. in an ancestor at the same time, then what we would predict is they would all cluster together on the tree. Mm. But what you see is that that isn't how it goes. You have the um, tiger pattern is sort of sometimes in between. Mm. There's some more distant related guys where all of a sudden the dentist ray and the, or in the dentist and the ray um, patterns show up. And so, um, what that is saying then is that there, you know, there's a more complex history there. And because they had that really nice data set that they had just generated from those hundred or so, or ninety six or so butterflies, they could then go back and actually do the phylogenetics for the first time with those exact enhancer regions, right? So these are um, these are DNA regions, and so they use that to build phylogenetic trees. Um, they're using a common methodology by maximum likelihood to infer the relationships between the butterfly species based on um, just those sequences. And so what you see now is actually a different arrangement um, in the uh, relationships between the butterflies if you use those two differing enhancer elements that are sitting right next to the optics gene. And so they kind of summarize it um, a lot of that data by just collapsing them into um, clades that they color code. And so for the, excuse me, for the dentist spots, you see that this looks uh, more closely like the, it is arranging in the tree as if it's more closely related mm. um, to the green clade, which has a lot of that um, tiger patterning. Um, and then um, in contrast, um, the ray spot is actually associating more closely with this blue clade um, that don't have mm. the, uh, the, the uh, ray uh, patterns on the hind wings. And so... Um, it's a really, I think, nice and kind of simple illustration of how if you build a tree with different sequence, you can get different answers if they've had, if those sequences have had a different evolutionary history in those lineages. So, so they rebuilt the tree based on these enhancer sequences, essentially, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. And so, and both of them are different mm-hmm. from the tree at the top, which is sort of based off yeah. of a more well-behaved yeah. uh, genetic region, so to speak, and is sort of the accepted, um, currently accepted hypothesis for how um, these butterflies have diverged from each other. Mm. And so then, you know, it gets a little bit um, complicated, but um, I, I think then uh, figure five actually does a nice job of actually modeling how they think based on those um, sort of, uh, non-congruent evolutionary patterns in the trees, how they might explain how these butterflies that are sort of distant or related to each other came to have the same morphological patterns. And so here they're kind of using this idea, um, and they bring it up in the paper a lot, and I think it's also worth introducing because it's a, another really important concept for evolutionary biology and population genetics in particular is the idea of, of um, coalescence. And so this is... Um, a population genetics framework where you're basically trying to trace some genetic variation back to its originating point. Um, and the way I'm not going to 
well, first of all, I'm not the best person to describe the um, quantitative population genetics here. But at least just to say from a conceptual point of view that sort of the simplest form of this idea is that if you're looking at any species today, that if you remove the possibility of recombination or natural selection or gene flow, um, which we'll get back to that point in a minute, that then you can actually set up a pretty good um, set of equations to predict um, when based on sort of the um, observations that you see uh, today through sampling to predict when that genetic um, material showed up or arose um, back in evolutionary time. The problem with this is life gets a lot more complicated, right? And so we have, um, when you go into the wild and you have uh, different populations sort of interbreeding where you get hybrids, um, and they ex are exchanging genetic material, there's recombination going on, you, want to, you end up with these introgression events or um, examples of gene flow where um, one species that is distant, distantly related from another today actually through hybridization and then backcrossing gained some genetic material from a, what is now a more distant relative. And, you know, just to, um, I guess it's the danger of rambling here, but just to um, echo back a little bit on our episode um, w with Nitin Fudness a couple of Twivos ago. He kind of studies this process in sort of more stark terms when hybridization is no longer possible. So this idea that integration or gene flow is cut off between species. Yep, yep. And then he's what he's studying then is the genetic basis of um, you know what blocks the possibility of gene flow at, and creates species barriers. Whereas the authors today are actually mapping these cases of integration or gene flow between different species and then inferring that and trying to figure out how this led to the sort of crazy patterns that they see today. So you're not saying that there's there was exchange of genes between different species, but back when two species two species exchanged genes and then one of them became a different species over many many years. Is yeah, that that's correct. Yeah, that's one way of saying it. So that basically in deeper time before, let's say, so if today we have species that are separated and basically if they mated together, they can't make viable right. offspring. Right. right. So they there's no gene flow today, but in their ancestors, um, there was. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And so then um, using these sort of high resolution gene genomic data sets with sampling many species, they can start to reconstruct or infer right. actually when these things were exchanged. And so they, for the case of these wing spots and the enhancers that they map, they propose five sort of key events that explain how these currently separate species might have come across the um, basically the same genetic material to the genotype that then, or part of the genotype that then um, leads to the phenotype of those wing patterns. Mm -hmm. And so they have, um, for the Dennis spot, they estimate that about two or million years or so, that in a lineage leading up to one of the Heliconia species, um, which I think is called Elevatus, so they infer that that's where mm -hmm. um, the enhancer for the Dennis spot sort of showed up or that they associate with the Dennis spot. And then um, there was sort of a deep... Uh, Integration event or uh, hybridization event that leads up to um, today's modern day lineage of Heliconius melpomene. Um, and that it was at about that time when melpomene um, actually sort of came up, so to speak, with the um, ray pattern enhancer that sits sort of next door. And so that was sort of, they infer that about, I don't know, 1.8 million years ago. And as the first appearance, basically, of both of these patterns together, or at least these enhancers together. And then, since then, it was kind of, you know, three more major hybridization events. One that brought the ray spots to the Elevatus lineage, or species, more recently. Um, and then um, another spread of that to a different Heliconius um, species, Timoretta. Um, and then Timoretta went for a while before... Um, they suggest that it got the um, enhancer associated with the Dennis spot hmm. and that that's sort of the most evolutionary recent hybridization that explains uh, the similarity in morphology. So could any of the, could any of the differences, not, not necessarily in this study, but 
could they arise from shuffling within a single species, for example? You know, yeah, you have yeah. you have four upstream elements, and then it goes to two, and you have a different pattern. Yeah, I think the answer is yes, and they kind of hint at that yeah. um, in their discussion, and I think they might have seen some of this in the data sets there as they were resequencing and really yeah, zooming yeah. in. But they don't, yeah, they don't go. You know, I guess you have to pick what you highlight in the yeah, paper, of course. and perhaps maybe that's part of another study. But yeah, I think. Um, that and and actually that's a another I would say theme of non coding sequence or regulatory evolution um, is that there can be a lot of within species um, variations that are sort of bubbling up and then can be tested or refined as well by mm-hmm. selection. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. By offhand, do you know how big the butterfly genome is? Oof, I don't actually. Uh, I think it's a pretty standard size for a lepidopteran for an insect, um, which is to say smaller than the human genome um, mm, yeah. by a fair amount, but you know, a decent sized eukaryotic genome. Yeah. I've yeah. been looking at trying to find it here, and I just found I mean, there's uh, a page, there's the butterfly genome database. Ah, yeah. It yeah, has yeah. its own page, and it's basically the Heliconius genome project, which is mm-hmm. exactly the, the genus we're talking about. And, and then there is a. Um, a Heliconius homepage, heliconius.org, is amazing. Every <laughs> every genus has its own genome page. It's cool. Yeah, I agree. This <laughs> this this, this um, set of butterflies has sort of been um, celebrated and studied for so long that it's really cool to see all of the resources kind of coming together. So it's a monarch database. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and I would say, you know, I mean, there are, it's it's a fascinating look at reconstructing evolutionary history and tying it together with this um, cool biology of mimicry. But I would still point out some, you know, limitations of the study, which is that we're still looking at all associations and and we're still basing this on phylogenetic inferences. And so, um, certainly to my taste, I mean, I, lo- I think some of the exciting work ahead is to actually experimentally test some of these hypotheses. So what is the drilling down on sort of what are the transcription factors or the impact of having, gaining or losing these enhancer elements? Mm. And um, before the episode, I was looking, and I think there is some, at least some progress on monarch butterflies, actually, with deploying CRISPR to do kind of genetic modifications. And so I wouldn't be surprised if this will be coming around the bend for hill oh, that's cool. as well. That's cool. Yeah. Then you, really then you can test this, right? You can make changes and see the colors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. By the that's way, right. it's 269 megabases. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. tiny. <laughs> that is, that's pretty modest compared to the, to the human genome. Although I would say, so this brings up a point that I wanted to raise um, about genome sizes. And again, mm-hmm. this is um, related to uh, non-coding sequences in the evolution of this. So, you know, one of the, uh, another controversy that has sort of raged, um, in addition to the, does evolution sort of, the mechanism of evolution, is it coding or non-coding, is also um, how much of non-coding sequence is actually functional. Yeah. So this, you know, this idea of junk junk DNA versus, um, we could say, garbage DNA, or, um, or um, there's been sort of a rise of this idea that maybe there is not so much junk DNA. And part of this came from um, some recent major genomic efforts, like, the, for example, the ENCODE project. So this is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And it was basically after the Human Genome Project to start to try to map kind of the functions of non-coding DNA as well as as we you know do the open reading frames in the um, protein coding regions to also gain it, sort of the lands- understand the landscape or the geography of the rest of the genome. And so... They ended up doing a lot of um, DNA binding assays, for example, and then came out with a really controversial conclusion in one of the main papers a few years ago that they claim that like 80% of the genome is basically functional by the definition of a piece of DNA that will bind to a protein. Mm. And so there's also there's been a kind of massive um, backlash against this idea that how and it, I think it boils down to the fact that how you define functional is really important. And just because some, a piece of DNA might be Binding to a protein doesn't necessarily mean that it's acting, for example, as an enhancer or a promoter or is modulating anything. It could just be sort of, again, the raw material um, of a genome that may not have sort of a physiological or a biological um, function as we might define it such that it would be acted on by natural selection. Mm. And so one of, the, one of the common arguments that folks use to sort of illustrate um, 
how much non-coding sequence might not be functional is this idea of the C-value paradox. And so this has been, I would say, championed by um, a fellow Ryan Gregory up in Canada and, and a few others. And so the C-value is basically the weight of um, DNA of a haploid genome measured in picograms, the so-called 1C value. And so, you know, and this is even occurring, the paradox is um, well known even before we were sequencing genomes and, and, you know, measuring genomes on size instead of weight or, ba- you know, size based on base pairs instead of weight and picograms. But basically what people have been seeing is that so-called quote unquote simple organisms have C values mm-hmm. that are far greater than quote unquote complex ones. Yeah. And so this has also been framed as something called the onion test. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea is that it's not the Shrek peeling back the onion, <laughs> by the way. <that's> <laughs> but the, the idea is that although onions have um, basically their genome is five times bigger or weighs five times more, is that because the onion has five times the sort of functional complexity? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, you can kind of see where that's going. Yeah, it's cool. Some of, some of these, I think like the, um, what is it? The orchid has a huge genome, I think. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of plants do. Um, you do have to, in some of those cases, um, those plants can be highly polyploid. Yeah. And so yeah, you have yeah, to yeah. correct for, for um, that, yes. the haploid. But even then, um, there's definitely massive uh, genomes out there. Uh, versus, you know, if you think about the streamlined genomes of bacteria, for example, um, then, uh, or even actually, uh, I think an example dear to your and my heart, if we think about the difference in the sizes of virus genomes going from the highly streamlined RNA viruses out to the sort of massive super tanker DNA viruses. Super tanker. <laughs> I like the viroids, 120 base pairs of non coding RNA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's amazing. And, of course, they, they they depend on a cell, so it's kind of not fair, right? Correct, yeah. And but, we're we're kind of blurring the definition of yeah. into more of kind of selfish genetic element, I would say. Yeah. Well, at some point, um, Nels, we'll be able to reconstruct cells from, from DNA, right? Mm-hmm. So we can figure out what's the minimal number of genes that you need to make a cell. Do you think yeah. that Do you think that'll happen at some point? Yeah, I mean, so there, I think there have been some early forays into this, yeah. you know, so like um, Craig Venter's group in, has done using, what is it, the um, uh, Helio, uh, what am Helico I Helio back there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and they've done that, you know, they've synthesized the entire genome and then sort of put it into uh, action. Yeah. Uh, put it in a yeast cell, I think, right? Yeah, that's, well, I think it was maintained that way but, and I, then, but, but i don't think they ever generated a cell from it right well i think they they generated another bacterial cell but it's sort of a a, a, uh, yeah. a trans yeah a trans transplant exp- almost genome transplant experiment i guess you'd have to do that because um you can't make it from scratch so i guess what the thing is that you replace the genome in an existing cell and see if you can Correct. carry out stuff, right? That's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have this sort of rogue hypothesis in my mind about, the again, of these lar- massive DNA viruses that um, as people keep sampling these giant viruses and mm. then they, they kind of cat- catalog what are the open reading frames. Yeah. And you start to see, like, basically metabolic pathways coming together. Yeah. And yeah. so the kind of rogue or crazy idea is, is there actually kind of... Um, contemporary cases where new life forms have emerged, where some of these massive viruses have actually picked up all of the material they need to be independent life forms and no longer dependent on a host cell. But um, that gets kind of a little bit wild. Well, if you look at the small um, bacteria that are, you know, they're um, endosymbionts, right? Their genomes are highly reduced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they do oh, yeah. they do exist as cells within another cell, and they get a lot of metabolic products from the cell, but they they make a cell, right, with like a, a one or two hundred thousand base pairs of DNA. I think is the smallest. Correct. Yeah, and so we have these sort of bacteria species going in one direction, where they're kind of um, becoming symbionts and sort of giving up their independent lifestyle, and perhaps these viruses going in the other direction, gaining genetic material. Um, I kind of like to think of these as microbial trains passing in the night, and then. Well, Kunin doesn't like that idea at all. He thinks that yeah. ga- the idea of gaining genes doesn't make any sense because uh, you never know what you're going to need, but and so forth. And there's no, there's he thinks there's little evidence for it, but other people do feel that gaining is uh, one way to get what you need. So yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. No, it's another interesting sort of, I wouldn't even say controversy, but just sort of conversation. Yeah, it's a conversation, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I think that about covers it Yep, here. I think that's great. Yeah. It was a neat paper, and I'm glad we move into uh, other organisms, right? Because we don't want to just do viruses for sure. Yeah, that's right. And um, I mean, we've definitely give the winged creatures their <laughs> moment in the sun. Maybe we'll have to see if we can find something. Maybe a worm. Yeah, now we're talking. Let's keep our eyes But you're, you're okay with this, right? You don't have a problem uh, doing all kinds of organisms, because I certainly don't. Oh, I love it. It's really fun. I mean, I... I think it's clear. I mean, it's a, it's another good uh, reason that we should be inviting guests is because yeah. then they can add that level of expertise that as we sort of sample around. Yeah, because um, we it's not our field, you know. Correct. But um, I I've had always throughout my career kind of myopic view because I'm in a microbiology department, right? Mm. And I I visited um, where was I in a biology department? Oh, Mississippi State. Mm-hmm. And there you get people working on all kinds of stuff, um, you know, people working on um, on fungi and and corn and and uh, amoeba in the soil. It's really fa- I can imagine their faculty meetings. They must be really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I think I mean interesting. The, the danger is also you know your department can kind of balkanize if yeah, people yeah, sort of, of go, but if. Um, I think that's what's a, a really fun way forward in our profession right now is exactly what you're saying is that we have these great diverse departments and to kind of reimagine how do we team up and move forward on some of this stuff. I think that's what's really cool about today's paper and a lot of the work that, that we've been considering so far. Are you in a biology department? I'm not. So I'm in the uh, human genetics department in the medical school, but um uh, there are five basic science departments, including um, biology and arts and sciences here at Utah. And so um, the nice thing here is the lines are, between departments are pretty well blurred, and it's a pretty collaborative place. And so we're starting to have these exact conversations. But in your department, it's mostly human-focused f- interests, right? Well, that's interesting, too. So we kind of um, – there is there is genome science and human genetics, but there's also a big contingent of model systems – uh, genetics from flies to worms and um, beyond. We've brought some viruses in with my group. Um, and so, uh, at least on the genetics uh, footing, it's definitely a pretty diverse crew. And that was one of the things that really attracted me to this department mm-hmm. was that it sort of has um, already some of that diversity in the topics and approaches that people are taking. Yeah, We have a couple of emails here. Uh, let's okay. get through them. Some of them go back a ways since when we have guests, we don't do emails typically. Yeah. Uh, we have one from Robin, two from Robin. Uh, one, he's correcting a mistake I made a while ago. He said, chimney sweeps get scrotal cancer. Testicular cancer is an entirely different animal. And I think I didn't say, we were talking about carcinogens and I was talking about oh. the, the chimney sweeps. And I think I said testicular, right. And I didn't mean that. I meant scrotal can't. Sure, sure. Well, to try to, to tie this to try to <laughs> <laughs> to try to tie this to a um, winged creature, which is our our theme, right? It reminds me of the peppered moths. Do you remember that the story? So the um, um, basically there are mo- pe- these peppered moth species. They're either actually really light colored wings or really dark colored wings. Mm-hmm. And the dark colored wings were guys that were living by um, smokestacks. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, so I remember. That, yeah. <laughs> just trying to tie it all together somehow here. Uh, And then uh, Robin sent a series of papers. I guess we kind of stimulated him. Oh, uh, great. Sent a a paper on a molecular clock, Mm -hmm. which is a big thing we'll talk about. Time-dependent estimates of molecular evolutionary rates. Yeah. Look at that. And then he sent one on uh, general interest evolution, which is, it's loading here. Time of Tree of Life reveals clock-like speciation and diversification. I guess at some point we'll talk about clocks a little bit more. Right? Yeah, we sh- we should. I'm glad he's bringing this up because um, there, we have seen clocks emerge in some of the papers, including today's, where they're estimating some of those introgression events on the order of like a million or two years ago. And so, yeah, yeah it's a good point. We should um, put a little more meat on the bones of how people actually make these estimates. And there's one paper related to what we talked about, estimation of phyletic trees from cladograms and birth orders. What's a, what's yep. a cladogram? Yeah, so cladograms and, and phylograms are the sort of two categories. And if I'm remembering 
um, properly. Uh, you know, so we've been looking at phylograms and cladograms um, are sort of not taking into account the uh, fine grain differences. So you're not um, basically a cladogram is just saying the relationship relative to everyone. Mm. So tr- tree the lengths of the branches on a cladogram will be identical, whereas a phylogram, depending on how different two characters are, the more different they are, the longer the branch of the tree right. will be. So that's kind of two ways. It's they're very related, but um, mm-hmm. just sort of two ways of visualizing the relationships. But there's phylogenetics is a um, is a active and um, I would say growing field, mm-hmm. and so um, it's it definitely um, it, it is good to consider what's happening sort of contemporarily. Also sent another one. The sea lamprey meiotic map improves resolution of ancient vertebrate genome duplications. Kind of is sort of similar to what we talked about today. Get, getting a, a view on older genome changes from uh, contemporary animals. Yeah, exactly. So again, you know, whether it's a butterfly or just sampling yeah. kind of all over the tree, there are these new insights that you can gain from these comparative approaches as they get more powerful. Yeah. And then one on uh, ver- evolution of vertebrate vision by means of whole genome duplication. This is in zebrafish. Which is that sounds. Yeah, sounds we, cool. we need to do a zebra paper at some point, right? Definitely. We did zebra finch, but we haven't done zebra right. fish. <laughs> we'll right. get there. Then we'll we get. have a letter from Hetty who writes, Doctors R and E, please, please, please invite Dr. Josh Drew to be a guest on your new podcast. He is also at Columbia, and I suspect he will say yes. Oh, and he's awesome. I like the new podcast. I'm glad all of you have time to read papers in diverse disciplines because I don't. <laughs> yeah, well, we're really lucky. <laughs> yeah. Part Hed- of the jo- job description, right? Yeah. Hetty <laughs> is a full-time lab manager, part-time grad student, person who occasionally sends complaints and fish parasite stuff to TWIP. Yes, I recognize you. Do you know Josh Drew? No, I don't. Do you? Nope. I Sounds mean, this like is uh, at uh, a different campus, uh, and sure. he's, a, he's an ecologist. He does coral reefs. Oh, cool. And um, I, I sure, we could get him on. Yeah. We'll see where things take us. Yeah, Columbia I, itself is a big e- ecosystem, isn't it? With it is. different campuses and everything. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. uh, we have one from Barbara. Why don't you read Barbara's uh, now? Is it too long for me? Oh, yeah. You're giving <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> you're <laughs> giving me the long one here. Okay, let me see what I can do here. I might do a little paraphrasing That's as we okay. go through. But so Barbara writes, Dear Evolving Tuivo hosts, greetings from San Francisco. I am writing to not only thank you for adding another podcast to the Twix family, but to suggest a future guest for Tuivo. I appreciated your introduction to the interesting history about the merging of molecular biology and evolutionary biology in episode number one. As Vincent mentioned in the first episode, I too, for a number of years, considered evolution relegated to dusty fossils and looking at phenotypic variation in nature. My myopic view probably comes from the fact that my job or my lab experience as a research assistant after graduating college in 1990 primarily had focused on using molecular methods to create DNA mutations in bacterial systems and studying the effects of these mutations in well-characterized bacterial lab strains. My eyes were opened in 2012 when I was introduced to modern molecular evolutionary biology at our Natural History Museum in San Francisco, the California Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park. Yeah, that's I haven't been there, but I've heard really good things um, about the... California Academy. Um, there's also, have you been, Vincent, to the um, Exploratorium? In, um, no, I have not. Yeah, me either. I've heard good things about that as well. Yeah. Uh, so Barbara goes on to say, I'm sure people know that many natural history museums have vast collections of specimens such as fossils, insects, and plants that are used by researchers to study topics of evolutionary interest. What may not be known is that in the basement of the California Academy is a microbiology lab focused on studying the evolutionary biology of microbes. The California Academy of Sciences mission statement is to explore, explain, and sustain life on Earth. And that mission includes microbes as they are so integral to life on Earth. That's a mission both you and I could get behind. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I think I'm going to skip a little bit if that's okay. Mm, Yeah. Um, By the way, I want to say that the American Museum of Natural History here in New York City also has people working on the evolution of microbes for the same reason. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolute. Um, and I'm going to, in my pick of the week, just to preview it, I'm going to talk about another uh, museum that I think uh, is an interesting one, sort of in an unexpected place. Um, so let's see. 
Barbara goes on to talk about her volunteering in the lab of Dr. Diane Bennett, who was hired in 2011 as the Academy's first associate curator of microbiology and is an evolutionary microbiologist focused on mosquito-borne RNA viruses and viruses of zoonotic origin, including hantavirus, the topic that uh, TWIV has been all over recently. The Bennett Lab is interested in the forces that shape the diversity of fast-evolving RNA viruses and, in particular, determining how these evolutionary changes impact human health in disease emergence. I'm going to skip a tiny bit just to say, in addition to overseeing her own lab, Dr. Bennett has recently been promoted to the Chief of Science for the California Academy of Sciences Research Division, the Institute for Biological or Biodiversity Science and Sustainability. In an effort to keep this letter short, I am including a web link to the microbiology department at the Academy for more information about the Bennett Lab and a list of Dr. Bennett's recent research papers. Volunteering in the Bennett Lab at a natural history museum has been a rewarding experience and has created a new awareness about evolutionary biology for me. Twivo is a nice complement to my volunteer work and provides entertainment as well. Best regards, <laughs> Barbara. We're entertaining. Yeah, I'll take that. Mm, mm, okay. <laughs> so, and then, and, <laughs> and then Barbara includes a few um, links here. Um, I, I, I really do like that idea of um, sort of microbiology um, unfolding in the um, context of a museum. I think we often think of museums as, as Barbara sort of points out, as more kind of collections of fossilized things. But to re reimagine museums as active places where new stuff is happening, I think that's a really um, important way forward um, for a lot of institutions. Yeah, it's cool. I see. I'm looking at the web page here, and I found a picture of uh, our letter writer, I think. No, it's somebody else. I thought I was all excited that we found your picture, but ah, it's yeah, somebody else. So Barbara um, found Twix through Coursera, my my virology course on Coursera. Oh, very nice. Yeah, uh, which I taught way back in 2013, and um, a lot of people always ask me, "Am I going to do it again?" And the answer is, uh, yeah, at some point. Cool. I don't know when, but uh, I'd like to try something else like edX, the MIT version of uh, open courseware. But we'll oh, do, yeah. I'll do it again yeah. at some point. Yeah, I think the idea of treating these things as sort of experiments and then seeing what gets traction and what works for yeah. you is a, yeah, it's a great great way of thinking about it. A lot of people have found the podcast through Coursera, but we did have mm -hmm. like 80,000 people register for my two virology <laughs> courses. So, wow, that is I mean, incredible. that's stunning. It's just yeah. stunning. It's uh, that Amazing. so many people are interested in viruses, but I don't blame them. Yeah, that's really great. Well, well thank you, Barbara. We will look into this, and uh, all suggestions for future topics are welcome, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot, Barbara. And we have one more from Stephen, who writes, Doctors LD and Racaniello. As a veteran of TWIV, I'm delighted to find TWIVO. I look forward to many more excellent episodes. I would like to submit a correction and a listener pick of the week. As of February 13th, I don't see any listener email listed, so maybe no one has mentioned this. At one point in episode one, in discussing the Australian sheep blowfly, Nels says that the blowflies will lay their larvae in sheep. And in fact, blowflies lay eggs on their host. Okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen, for the correction. I think I was thinking too much about those um, these um, caterpillars, actually, that are parasitized by wasps. Yep. And in that, in that case, the wasps do actually That's right. gain access. But yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Flesh flies, sarcophagidae, are oviviparous, depositing larvae or hatching eggs on hosts. Gives a couple of links. I got interested in this issue last year after listening to the audiobook version of The Dante Club, in which the author makes the same mistake. So you're in good company. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, I do have Dean and Thornton on my iPhone. <laughs> wow. I like it. I love it. As a listener pick of the week, specific to Twivo, I suggest the wonderful Darwin's Legacy 2008 from Stanford University. And he gives a an iTunes link to that. Oh, cool. I haven't seen that. I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. And let, uh, let us move on to some picks. What have you got, Nels? Yeah, so for my science pick of the week, I wanted to sort of build off of this um, theme of science museums, and so I'm gonna. I wanted to lift up the Hill Country Science Mill, 
in Hill Country, Texas. This is in Johnson City, Texas, about an hour west of Austin. And there's um, a family connection here. So my father recently retired. He was a neuroscientist um, up at the University of Minnesota. And he and my um, stepmother have opened a a science museum in an old Eh. grist mill (laughs) as their sort of retirement project. In Minnesota? No, this is in um, Texas? Johnson City, Texas. Did they? No. Did they move or, or what? Well, so they have a they built a house there. Oh, sort of, uh, this happens for a lot of Minnesotans as they retire is they'll sort of find a winter destination outside of the icy grips mm-hmm. of the upper Midwest. And so s- summers, they still reside in Minnesota. Um, and actually, the truth is, since they've opened the science mill, it's been open for a year. So the anniversary was... Um, just a couple of weeks ago in February, they've mostly been down in Texas getting this thing up and running. Um, but check it out. So it's a good website, and it's a highly interactive. So they took the idea was with this gr- old grist mill um, to keep the silo, the grain silos, and some of the old architecture, and then reimagine the space with a science museum, interactive science museum for kids, um, kind of focusing on middle school age, but going in both directions, young and old, so that uh, folks in that uh, neighborhood, uh, and this is about, a, and if you look at the hour radius around Johnson City, you've got Austin, Texas, you have San Antonio, and a few other major cities and small towns all between, uh, a place for kids to come and explore how science works in an interactive, hands-on way. And so my father mm. um, is probably, even as we're podcasting, is probably hatching zebrafish embryos right now for tomorrow's crew that will come in and count, or watch an embryo develop and count heartbeats in a... Mm. In a, in a growing zebrafish. This is cool. It's very cool. I also, uh, part of the reason I picked <laughs> to, to, to highlight this today is it's also my father's birthday coming up. And right. so I'll send him some birthday wishes as part of our Twivo podcast here. So I'm on the page here and I see Robert LD's picture and I see you are on the board of directors as well as Robert LD, who is your brother, I presume? Yeah. So Robert, <laughs> that's my father. Um, oh, right, Bert, you're right. Yeah, yes, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah not at all. <laughs> He's <laughs> and, also on the board, yeah. <laughs> and it's probably good for pointing that out just for like a conflict of interest statement, just to full disclosure. I am on the board. Um, no, that's okay. And and have been down there a few times. I helped to design one of the exhibits, actually. It's on um, DNA sequencing, um, genome sequencing. Neat. And it has been so much fun to be a, a small part of this and to see. So it's been a great reception. Kids from all over. I've been coming and really enjoying it. Great, um, great reactions, and I think um, it's off to a wonderful start. How do they raise money to get this off the ground? So this was a combination of um, some fundraising efforts uh, that are ongoing, mm-hmm. um, as well as sort of self financing as well. Um, uh, and I think it was just you know as so both of my um, parents, uh, my stepmother and father, were both in science, and um, as they're figuring out how to continue to be in science, this turned into like a, a really important project to them. And so they've been mm. investing in it kind of at all levels with um, blood, sweat, tears, and uh, money as well. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Do they charge people to go? They do. The prices are, are I would say, very reasonable and, and at least meant to be that way, to try to keep that as low of a barrier yeah, as yeah. possible. So that, that helps, uh, I guess, right? Correct. There's also a lot of foundations in the area that are increasingly, they've um, been contributing and um, uh, as they've gotten great attention and good feedback on the program. So there's they have a very big summer camp program, for example, that has been winning some awards. Um, and these great longer week long experiences where kids are coming um, in the summer. There's also um, a, a number of uh, kids in that community who are homeschooled, and uh, so the resources of a place like the Science Mill can kind of, uh, I think, really accelerate or amplify the science curriculum available to that community as mm-hmm. well, and reach an audience that might not otherwise be reached. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of lifting all boats, That's I would cool. say. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I'll be down there actually next week to check in. We're going to have a um, board meeting and and uh, get an update on how things are going. Does your how dad about, know you're podcasting? He does. So I'm hoping. Yeah, that's <laughs> kind of why. <laughs> that's why I wanted to wish him a happy birthday. I'm hoping he's listening to this when it comes out, um, and that he. So he said that he's really enjoying the episodes okay. so far in the in the conversations as he's um, tuning in. Yeah, yeah. Cool. How about you, Vincent? I think you have a pick of the week that's pretty interesting here as well. Yeah, I got I picked something that's related to today's paper and here at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, like many other museums, we have a butterfly conservatory. 
Oh, yeah. And it is really very nice. I've been to a few of these in other places, and it's just a lot of fun to walk in and watch the butterflies, and they're beautiful, and you can watch them hatching and so forth. And it's pretty cool to have this in New York City. Yeah. But, of course, their website is also very good, and you can get lots of information about things that I should know, like metamorphosis, right? <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> the butterfly begins life as an egg. <laughs> there we go. They don't mention sex. Hey, come on. <laughs> the primary function of the male butterfly is to find a female. Here you go. There we go. Male butterfly uses vision to locate and lures her with chemicals. They also perform elaborate courtship flights. So there you go. Lots of information. And American Museum of Natural History is on Central Park West at 79th Street. And it is a famous place here in New York. Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, used to work there. Oh, yeah. And... um and of course, they have people working on microbiology, as they said, and they're doing genome sequencing and studying evolution. They also have the Hayden Planetarium, which is part of the museum. And the very the director is the famous Neil deGrasse Tyson, who uh, um, is, is has a radio show and a podcast, and makes me very jealous because he raises <laughs> lots of money for his podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, but you should check that out. That's I also, cool. I also wanted to. Um, so after last podcast after the last Twivo, Sarah Sawyer sent me her pick of the week, and it's too bad she couldn't actually deliver it on the show, so I thought we, oh, would, yeah. we would read her pick. She said uh, um, this paper was, she, she selected a paper by uh, Towner et al., Isolation of Genetically Diverse Marburg Viruses from Egyptian Fruit Bats, published in PLOS Pathogens in ooh, 2009. Mm-hmm. And she writes, this paper was mentioned by Kartik during the podcast. It is the paper where Marburg was first isolated from bats. It is an older paper, but I'm picking it because, in my opinion, any paper with the following sentence in the methods deserves a sexier journal than PLOS Pathogens. Well, hold on, Sarah. I'm an <laughs> associate editor at PLOS Pathogens. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she quotes, apart from dermestid beetles, spiders, crickets, moth flies, and cockroaches, the only other fauna seen in the cave, consisted of a target rat, Stochomus longcodatus, and forest cobras, Naha melanoleuca. End of quote. Particularly when, in addition to those forest cobras, there are Marburg-infected bats in that cave, and the researchers are in BSL-4 spacesuits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love That's it. pretty yep. cool. That's pretty high-stakes biology going on there, right? Yep. Yeah, wow. Well, thank you for that. And then we, of course, also had a guest pick from uh, Stephen. Yeah. So there you go. And that does it pretty much for Twevo number six. Fantastic. And we are heading towards the magic number of 12, Nels. That's right. We're getting there. When we get past 12, we'll, we'll last. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take another six months, though. <laughs> Steady as she goes. You can find Twevo at iTunes and also at microbe.tv slash Twevo. And you can send your questions and comments and corrections to Twevo at microbe.tv. You can find Nels at cellvolution.org, and you can find him on Twitter as L Early Bird, E L Early Bird. Thank you, Nels. Thank you, Vincent. Really fun to talk. And I am Vincent Rackenyeller. You can find me at my blog, virology.ws. I'm also on Twitter as P R O F V R R. The music you hear on Twevo is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us, and we will be back next month. Until then, be curious. <laughs>